Dale Doherty is the uh, founder and CEO of Maker Media, which uh, produces Make Magazine and Maker Fair. He is also the visionary and chair of the board of the Maker Education Initiative and has really spent a lot of time thinking about bringing making into the education space and uh, we are so thrilled that he is here with us today. So thank you so much. Dan. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Good afternoon. I know I'm not actually Kip's on after me, so I have nothing to see you later, Daryl. Uh, oh, I can move it. Okay, yeah, actually, feel free to reorganize. Um, but uh, have a short video from this year's Maker Fair, which we're delighted to see. It's actually called a drone's eye view of Maker Fair. Um, and uh, we're going to take a, a, just a quick look at that. It's just a couple minutes. Uh, Chris is working on that. Thousand people this year out at Maker Fair in the Bay Area, um, and uh, it's about our eighth year doing the event. And who would have ever thought that so many people find this ed entertaining, educational? Um, what's that? <laughs> that's, Steve's, that's Steve's talk. <laughs> Steve, come back here. Um, and and so uh, you know, one of the delights is ten minutes after the. Fair uh, opens, there's a line of 50 people outside the Learn to Solder tent. And people are waiting to try to learn to do something that they might have thought was hard, but they learn it's not as hard as they thought, and they can do it. And I think the, the, the spirit of Maker Fair, uh, you know, it's, it's really represented in the individual makers who come. I had a, I was just looking at a letter from someone. It was a, it was a, a man who had brought a uh, an electric car, like a custom, like, looked like a roadster, but it was made out of metal. Just absolutely beautiful. But he's, a, he's an older man who'd retired, you know, he had worked in, in some other occupation, but this was like a dream of his. And he said he came to Maker Fair and he had maybe the best time he'd ever had in his life. And he was so uh, delighted to meet other people who like to invent and create and make. And he had no idea there was such a big community of people connecting to that. And in an essence, that is what this is about, is people connecting to each other um, who come from, I, I think, very different perspectives and different ideas. But uh, they somehow 
you know, um, if I walked you through as I did a tour, you know, and I take people through, I say, let's look at this and look at this. And I'll say, you know, those 10 things normally don't go together, you know, anywhere else but Maker Faire. They kind of make sense here, but they're very different. And, um, you know, we'll see things. <laughs> you know, and, um, <laughs> and this. But people's expressions are, are diverse. And, and I think one of the things we always wanted out of Maker Faire was it's, it's really, uh, Michelle, one of our, our education writers called you know, it's exhibition, not competition. Everybody could do something different, and it can still be exciting and interesting. So, uh, you know, the biggest surprise for us, really, at Maker Faire has, I mean, we designed it, we thought about it as a family event. But everybody remarks, did you see how many kids were there? And, you know, we just see so many people uh, bringing, coming as families, bringing the kids, bringing the grandparents, and having a great time. They're spending seven and eight hours at the event seeing all, all these things. And the thing that bothers me, and it's sort of, you know, is the kid leaving who says, I want to be one of those people. I want to do those kinds of things. And where do I direct them? Where do they go next? Because we all learned how to do these things in rather exceptional ways. Um, but I can't tell them they'll find this at school. I can't tell them they'll find it you know, in specific places in their community. But um, it is starting to happen that we're creating maker spaces and places where people go. And again, if you're a parent and you see your kid doing this, you light up and you say, I, can, I want to support that. That's great. So, um, but, uh, and I think one of the roles of Maker Faire is actually to show parents that kids like doing this kind of thing, that tinkering is something they could spend hours on. So, and, and we, we kind of see a concern among parents of kids, like when I grew up watching too much TV, that our kids are spending too much time on the computer, too much time in front of an iPad, that this is different. It's a different kind of learning environment for them and so we are trying to, trying to figure this out. I, I threw out this because I just got this in. Next week we have the White House Maker Fair, which is an amazing opportunity to get the word out to lots of people about what's going on. We were calling it a day of making, and we used our robot with a little Lincoln hat on here. So I just got, um, this is a preview of our graphics for it. But we want, it, we want it to be fun for everybody. I think that's kind of the, part of the secret. The fair is fun, the magazine is fun. And yet, you know, actually it was Joey's remark once, he says, you know, I don't feel like I'm learning, you know, but he is. You know, you, 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 you don't, um, what happens here sort of is natural, it feels, it feels good. So, uh, let's see, was there, um, I wanted to, as part of my talk, rather than talk too long, is introduce you to some of the interesting people I've met here today and have them show you or t tell you what they're doing. I'm going to invite Michael up. And um, I love when people bring things and have <laughs> things to show. And Michael, we got to talking about how he got this through the TSA, <laughs> or, or did not. Um, but let's, it. Without saying, what do you think this is? And if you saw this coming through your luggage and the blinky lights going on, <laughs> and then it decided, well, open it up. What's inside? Oh my god, it gets scarier, right? <laughs> but what, what do you think this is? Yeah, it's a, but it's a water bottle, right? That you've converted. It's a water bottle. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's explain familiar, what it is, Michael. Familiar accessible materials. Um, so this is an underwater glider. Uh, it doesn't have a propeller, but it is a submarine of sorts. Um, inside, there's a big syringe, uh, and there's a little motor, and there's an Arduino also and a circuit board. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's. The TSA said that it, it ticked four out of six like red flags. <laughs> there's a circuit board. There's a power source. There was tubing. And anyway, um, so and what, what, what would you do with it? So what? What we? This is modeled after the full scale gliders, which they're about six feet long and they collect ocean data. Um, so this the smaller glider is designed for high school students to build. Um, and so you, you put it in the water. You you let it run. Um, we have a sensor pack. You can put on there, so it'll log temperature and pressure data. And the way that it, it flies is by taking in a little water, it causes it to sink, 
At the same time, it pitches downward, so it dives, and it spends most of its time coasting, right? So it spins a little motor to, to move that syringe, and then it just coasts for a while, depending on how deep you're going. And then it'll push that water back out, move the weight aft, come back up to the surface. Um, so it's a little mechatronics project. It's a little AUV, um, and it can run for a long period of time. This is on triple A's, and it'll run for a whole day. The full-scale gliders run for months at a time. They have a little satellite radio, and it sends back data to uh, physical oceanographers on shore. What does it cost? So this is less than $100 in parts. Uh, we're working on uh, turning it into a kit that's accessible to anybody. It's open source. There's a full bill of materials and instructions detailed instructions for how to build it um, up on our website, seaglide.net. Um, just a quick little background about me. I'm a mechanical engineer for the Navy, actually, and this is kind of a side project as our educational outreach. I work out at Carter Rock at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, um, and we have some funding to do educational outreach in local schools, and we also do some camps partnering with other warfare centers and other, um, other partners. We're going to be doing a camp at the MIT Edgerton Center uh, in just about a month. Um, so yeah, it's, it's designed as a, a platform for, for students to start from, you know, maybe they've done one or two little projects in middle school, like Sea Perch or something similar where they can build something. And there's, there's built skills involved in this too, but they're new skills. There's programming a microcontroller, understanding circuits, um, understanding buoyancy and this novel form of propulsion and, um, and then once you get the basic glider built, of course, there are all kinds of add-on modules. <laughs> you can add a controllable rudder, wireless communication, um, additional sensors. Um, so, so it's a fun little project. And, That's terrific. Yeah. Well, this is the kind of stuff I want to get into classrooms. And, and That's what we're trying to do. It's build them, right. And, um, and, you know, it really is, I mean, for the cost of, you know, the, the other side of this is, you know, 10 years ago, this would be a million dollar project. You know, you'd be building custom components for this. Oh my good, what you is turn it on. <laughs> uh, oh, he's turning it on with his cell phone. I've got a little remote Which when the TSA slide. says, well, you can put that in the cargo hold, he puts yeah. out the cell phone. <laughs> Shows <laughs> what you can do with that. But, um, I'll pause it. But, <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah. But at any rate, these are the kind of things you see in the maker community. And the real question I've had is, how do we get them into the classroom? Um, you know, we have individuals pushing them in and testing them, but, you know, and the other side is there's an opportunity to create a community of classes and, and students that are building these with new ideas, different applications, and, and taking it much further. So thank you, Michael. That's a great example. Yeah, I What's appreciate it. Sea Glide. Sea Glide. Sea Glide. Okay. Yep. So it's a great example. Thank you for yep. bringing it here. Um, let's see, Isabella, would you come up? Um, Isabella uh, is the manager of a new uh, tech shop which is opening up in Arlington. And uh, tell, tell us about yourself. Just grab the mic and go with it. You, you probably right. don't need me to ask you questions, you know. Well, we just opened about two months ago. We're having our grand opening on the 21st of June. But we're a tech shop. It's our eighth location. We started in Menlo Park and then moved to San Francisco, San Jose. And then about three years ago, started spreading across the country. And this is our eighth location. So yeah. We're really excited, especially to be at this conference today, because one of the things that we haven't had happen at all the locations across the board is STEM programs and programs for kids. So we're here just trying to get some momentum and advice on what we need to do to make our community and the makerspace that we have mostly for adults more accessible for kids. So you pay a monthly model, you go to a tech shop, and you have access to really advanced machines and tools. And one of the ways of thinking about it, particularly uh, for adults, is you know, uh, engineering, it, it, for the most part, is required to have access to a lab and to materials. Um, what we see in the Bay Area is, you know, you can be a freelance engineer. You can come up with your own idea, walk into a tech shop, develop that, and have a prototype. And you could also be 12 years old and do that as well. So, um, but a, a tech shop, I would say, is not over necessarily designed for kids. They come in with a parent and things. But this is sort of the area that we need to develop is figure out how to take some of what's happening in the adult world at tech shops, at fab labs, and, and figure out how it works for more and more kids. Yeah. Tell us about yourself, though. I, how did you get into being a manager at a tech shop? I'm, I'm delighted asks, to see that. Everyone asks me that, and it's honestly luck. I mean, I was waiting for an opportunity like this, but I have a very 
different background. I'm not necessarily a maker. I'm more do in terms of making like 3D projection mapping and more like computer stuff. But that was my hobby as a background. Um, my, you know, career background is I worked in sustainable development, doing water resource management and sustainable agriculture infrastructure in like India and Argentina. But so I don't know how I exactly fit into that other than luck and finding that there's a tech shop opening in Crystal City. I used to live in San Francisco, so I knew the name and just wanted to get involved in something that was starting here. Well, I hope um, one of the issues we have is access to women mm -hmm. in these spaces, so yeah. I hope you'll think about programs. Absolutely. You know, Alex, um, she's not here right now, but she's our education coordinator. Her and I are working, you know, night and day to do the summer programs this summer starting in July for kids. Um, we're doing, you know, high-tech music, high-tech art, um, smart textile programs, and robotics for kids. But starting in the in September, around the fall, we're going to do a women's maker program and an after-school girls program and kids program as well. I really want to start a, a women's auto mechanic group. <laughs> 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 I feel like yeah. that so cool. That's great. Thank you, Isabella. No I appreciate it. You know, there's uh, kind of two people that come to tech shop, and I think it's true of most maker spaces. One, someone that knows exactly what they want to do. They've already figured out they have a project and they want to execute it. And then there are the people that actually just really literally want to be there. And they want to figure out how to use these cool tools and, and develop them. They don't come with a project and so they need support in a different way. Um, and, but their goal is to, I think, get to that place. Uh, David Lang is one of our book authors. He's actually does a project kind of similar to Michael's called Open ROV, which is underwater uh, robotics. But he was a young man who was working like for an insurance company in a cubicle and just decided that wasn't who he wanted to be or what he liked to do. And he walked in the tech shop and he saw it and he says, I want to figure out how to do this. And, and he joined and you know, very intentionally began to learn the tools there. And he wrote a book for us called Zero to Maker. And, and that's kind of what I, we use that term in our community to mean you know, those who, you know, the onboarding or on-ramp of people um, wanting to become makers. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he met people there, like his partner, Eric, who was working on the robotics, underwater robotics, and they joined uh, and began working together. So, um, and my next uh, guest here is, is Joey Hudy, who's, uh, thankfully, we have a student in the audience here. Come on up, Joey. Um, Joey, of course, is, is famous for his extreme marshmallow cannon, which um, I didn't see it working there yesterday, Joey. What happened? Um, it's shipping. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joey, I want you people. I want you to tell people the backstory a bit of, you know, um, I kind of know it, but how was school for you about five years ago? Um, it was kind of not. I don't want to say a waste of time, but it was. I was actually teaching some parts of the class in the sixth, seventh grade, um, and then. It, after school, I would go home and I would look, learn about making and building stuff out of cardboard. So I would be doing most of my learning at home. And and you didn't necessarily feel that it was appreciated, what you what you could do or what you know how to do. Yeah, there really wasn't a, a path I could take to go beyond what I was doing and taking it into school. Mm -hmm. And um, so you came to a Maker Fair for your first time, and what did you see there? I saw everything that I was doing at home and more and. A large opportunity for me to learn what everybody else was doing there. Okay, and um, and then you came back like the next year with your own projects, didn't you? Yeah, um, actually the first year too. First year, and so um, what was it you showed the first year? I sure I showed the cannon that I was showing here yesterday. Right, and then um, you began showing it more and more, and uh, you've gone to you know numerous fairs just showing your work and. <laughs> <laughs> What well, what does it mean to you? Um, how does it change your attitude towards school? Um, it really brightens up school and it shows me that paths I can take in school and um, the school I'm going to is uh, a special school, school called Herbert Young Scholars Academy that actually lets me go on and do all these maker things along with it and uh, has a nice STEM program along with it too. So it's really helped me with school and stuff. Okay, and you've been to China and to Rome and to lots of other places. Um, it's opened up some interesting opportunities for it. And the White House, the State of the Union address. So um, we're all very proud of Joey. So thank you, Joey. Thank you. Shout out to uh, his mom, uh, Julie, is 
who's our prototype maker mom, um, <laughs> who sees in their child uh, this ability and wants to foster it and develop it. And she's been uh, actually a big contributor, and I think there's a great opportunity to, to leverage more moms. And I've, I've interviewed a number over the years, sometimes in the you know, when they have a child who they give tools instead of toys to that, that need space and want to begin building things. And often school doesn't seem like a good fit for them. And uh, what I'm happy to see is a transition with Joey to kind of be able to take that work and, and uh, bring it back. Well, my, uh, my last guest is, is uh, Cora. Um, and uh, Cara, sorry. And, uh, and she is from the Kids Discovery Museum or yes. something like that. Kids Museum, <laughs> something Kara's, like that. Kids Museum. Yeah. So uh, I just met you today, yes. but um, um, you're a Maker Fair organizer and you you opened this space. And just tell us a little bit. I, I just sure. uh, tell people about how you started, what you're doing, and what you are doing. Okay, sure, great. Um, so I'm with an organization called Kid Museum. I'm the founder um, of this organization that's really inspired by um, creating more opportunities for kids to develop their creativity, curiosity, and compassion about the world, all through a playful exploration of the world. Um, and had this idea, uh, has been long in the making. We actually went um, out to Pittsburgh, was our first introduction. Um, to seeing in action what a makerspace could be for kids. And that has inspired us to um, really take this on as a centerpiece of what we're creating here locally in the DC area um, for kids and families in this new museum. Um, and our, uh, our path has, has very much been shaped by the maker movement. And we um, started really launching uh, with both feet into this with uh, doing the Maker Fair in Silver Spring last year that was officially a, a mini Maker Fair, but got 12,000 people out for the first event of its kind. And um, you know, we just really felt um, that we had tapped into an incredible energy in this area for, you know, as you're saying, more opportunities for parents to expose their kids to making experiences um, and kids seeking that out. Yeah. Um, so we felt like this was, um, we really tapped into something that uh, we are taking it to the next step now with the partnership with the county is donating space in a busy public library, um, but giving us 7,500 square feet in that library as the first maker space um, geared toward kids and, and families in this area. So this is our a little preview of our maker playground concept, um, which you can see is really um, one big open room, uh, which is fabulous in terms of exposing kids to lots of um, different tools, materials, just letting them follow their imagination about what they want to make. Um, so, you know, we're very focused on a mix of the tactile and the digital. Um, our creative director comes out of MIT Media Lab and Exploratorium, so um, has had a lot of experience with standing up the tinkering studio and um, in integrating the digital um, with the that tactile experience. Um, so that's what we're about to launch, uh, announcing on June 18th this partnership and opening in the fall. So great, thank you. I particularly like that you're a museum inside a library yeah. and just a sort of mashup of different institutions. And I think that that's, it's that's been, terrific. It's been great, and the libraries have been really excited about this as a way to bring yeah. making to this area. Yeah. So. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Carmen. Now, um, Library, you know, a lot of the good stuff that happens in this community is because of people uh, like Kara and, and librarians and teachers that are, are just uh, doing it on their own to some degree. They're figuring it out and making it happen. And I applaud them. I mean, um, and I, I, I hope we can only do things to support them and, and not uh, uh, take, it, take it away. I think because you know, I, I see with teachers that they feel like this is why they got into teaching is to do creative work and inspire students to become, um, you know, uh, capable and, and engaged. And same with librarians. I think, you know, this li library was the DIY learning, you know, hub for all of us. We, you know, if you want to figure something out, you went to the library. And I uh, kind of reimagining what a library is with tools and uh, all these kinds of things I, I think are, is really important. Well. Um, I thought I'd leave uh, some questions, time for questions, and, and uh, if anyone uh, wants to ask me, I'm, uh, 
I'm really happy to have you all here. Uh, the White House Maker Fair, I think, is, is something uh, that will kick off a lot of interest. I will say that, you know, try to, try to understand the community and just really think about it as a community effort, not just an educational effort or not just a, you know, whatever department or agency you might be worth it, uh, with is um, understand this is a, a, a still young and emerging community, um, but it's something that I, I believe will last, something that is not just a, a, a trend. I think it's like a tradition. When I started Make Magazine, I went back and looked at old magazines like Popular Mechanics in the 1950s, Popular Science, and they encouraged people, you know, in just their writing to go out and do projects that were fun and, and engaging. And I wanted to create that, you know, again, because those magazines don't do that anymore. You know, like Space Hotel 2017. You know, I mean, you can't go build that in your backyard. Um, you could with cardboard if you're imaginative, but uh, other than that, it's, a, a, it's not real. So, um, and, and I think that so many comments I heard today is that kids are desperate to get out of the artificial walls of, of education and into the real world and engage and learn from real experiences. And making offers them something there that's very powerful. So thank you, and let me see if you have any questions or any, any comments. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Robert O'Quinn. I manage the technology programs in Fairfax County, the yes. after-school technology programs. Uh -huh. uh, I went to my first uh, Maker Fair in Reston a couple of months ago mm -hmm. uh, with Brian Jacoby, and he turned me on to Make Magazine. Mm -hmm. And I go to the Make Magazine website, and there's this extensive archive of everything you can imagine to do. And I, I hope you just keep that free and accessible because that's uh, that's most valuable tool I've found so far. That's great. Well, that's good. I I think um, you know it's an old-fashioned thing to produce a print magazine, but it's also online. But what I hear, uh, you know, teachers will hand it hand out. That's actually the goal of Maker Fair is when you see what other people are doing, it inspires you. If I ask you at a blank slate, what do you want to make? Eh, I don't know. I mean, but when you see someone doing stuff with bikes or someone. You know, whatever that is, it looks inspiring. Um, you know, give people motors and give them robots, and and uh, you know, it's it it does. You know, our goal in the magazine and the fair is really to showcase what the makers are doing, and it, it really is pretty cool and incredible. Any other questions? Actually, uh oh, this would be hard. <laughs> it's not going to be hard, but my question is, um, for some people, they may not know what is your maker story. Well, that's a good question. You know, this is, um, I started the magazine because I like to learn to do things. I'm not necessarily good at anything or even, you know, I'm an English major from college. I'm self-taught in computers and things and I don't have any extensive capabilities as a maker. Um, but I'm really curious and I like to learn, anything. I like to make cheese or make bread or I, I'm not gonna do that professionally but I'd like to know how that make, you know, how things, work I'm I'm um, but I think you know just like seeing uh, Michael's <laughs> bottle rocket or whatever we want to call it um, is uh, I'm just curious about that what's the story behind that and how does it work and how did you come up with that and and how will it be used so I, I thought of myself more in this as a community organizer and connector than than you know uh, um, my own making, uh, I don't have time for it because I'm busy doing other things. But it, it does connect to me, you know, as a, as a way to build community and to, to learn how to, you know, you find so many interesting people in the community that do something that you never, you know, you never knew anything about. So that, that's my maker, maker. So I'm, I'm, you know, and I think it starts, I always wanted to make a magazine. You know, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a bookish person. I learn from books, and, and I thought, you know, to be able to share these stories and create a beautiful magazine that, uh, that, that you know, is fun and enjoyable, that really makes, makes me happy, so. Anyone else? Or comments? Okay. Well, um, I, let me come back to this. Just, so next Tuesday, no, Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Uh, this is it National Day of Making. Um, hashtag Nation of Makers. White House is doing things, but I'd like to encourage you in your own institution, your own organization, to figure out something. We're going to be putting up a site where people can register events like meetups, could have an open house at a maker space. Um, we're trying to encourage um, a, a number of different things, but I'm trying to encourage parents to get involved in their schools and libraries and, and, and figure out how they can push this forward. 
I have a metaphor from this of the school garden. Almost every school they seems to have a school garden. How did they get there? It wasn't a federal mandate. It wasn't a Department of Education priority. It was simply something that parents thought about and they went to the school and said, can I take that miserable plot of land and turn it into a garden? And nobody said no really loudly, so they were able to do that. There wasn't you know, a curriculum for it. There wasn't even a strategy for it. But it got there. And then people figured out what the value was. And now there's curriculum, and people kind of uh, use it quite frequently. So I, I think there's an opportunity to leverage this community to participate and help build this infrastructure and sustain it inside of schools. So that will be part of our announcement for next week. But I'd love to see parents be able to go in various places and get together and meet others who are interested as well. Okay, well thank you for your time, thank you for coming here today, and I, I, I'm really glad to, uh, that this was organized as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah.